Hi, well here I am in Exchange Chambers in the Manchester offices. Of course they have offices also in Leeds and Liverpool as well. And I'm very lucky today to be joined by Mark Corson QC, who uh, is a very experienced Chancery practitioner. Uh, and he's going to talk today to, to, to some insolvency points uh, uh, and reform of the law generally perhaps, but also of course reflect on his long practice uh, in the area. Okay, thanks very much Mark for agreeing to be interviewed. Uh, I won't go all Jeremy Paxman on you, uh, hopefully. Um, yeah. So, uh, would you be able to give us please a brief biographical summary uh, and uh, also a summary of your practice, please? Right, uh, well, uh, by way of biography, um, I was born in the Southport area, I was brought up in Southport. Uh, I went to Liverpool University, read law at Liverpool University, and um, after Liverpool University, I um, spent a year as a sabbatical officer, actually, in the student union at Liverpool University, and then went off to do my bar finals. Uh, I did my pupillage in what is now Erskine Chambers in London, my first six months pupillage in Erskine Chambers in London, and my second six months chambers in St James's Chambers in Manchester. And I practised in St James's Chambers in Manchester uh, from... Uh, 1983 through to 2001 um, when I moved to Exchange Chambers. Um, I started off doing a fairly broad range of, of Chancery work um, but um, one of the main specialisations has always been throughout my career uh, insolvency work. I took silk, that means becoming a QC in 2001 and have practised as a QC doing a fair amount of insolvency work um, since then. So you moved chambers in the year that you took silk as well that's actually. right yeah. yes I did yes 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 the two actually weren't linked in the sense that I had decided to move chambers whilst my application was in for silk and I moved chambers and when I took silk I was in a different set of chambers than that, that I was in when I applied so did your old set had a heavy insolvency practice and then you moved to a set that had a similar insolvency practice I, indeed indeed that's right yeah yeah um okay so that's uh, thanks very much for that background you also now sit in a part-time capacity as a deputy high court judge and also a recorder. Would you I, be able to tell I, us about that? I please? do. Yeah. Well, um, so far as it went, I started off strangely enough sitting on crime as a as a recorder, um, and uh, then started doing civil work as a recorder. And then um, about ten years ago, I was given the opportunity to sit as a deputy high court judge, sitting in the Chancery Division, which uh, obviously took me back into my comfort zone. Actually, sitting on cases that I knew rather more about and um, doing um, sitting sitting as a, a deputy high court judge I've uh, sat on a, a number of insolvency cases. So do you enjoy the process of judgment writing more or is it different to your opinion writing as a barrister? I think it's a, it's, it's a very different exercise than from being a barrister or, or writing opinions in a sense. I mean the nice thing about being a judge is you, you can sit there often with some very competent uh, barristers in front of you presenting their case and taking you, to, taking you to all the cases so that by the time you've heard the submissions, you've, uh, you, you've heard both sides of the argument, you can go away and digest it and then write an opinion, uh, sorry, write a judgment, which can be a satisfying exercise. The difference, I suppose, as a barrister writing an opinion is that you're, doing, you're starting off doing the research and therefore coming up with the, with, with, with the arguments. And do you, do you find, you, you sort of monitor how your judgments are then proceed in the appellate court sense? Or? Oh, absolutely, yes. You're very, very mindful about whether, whether judgments are appealed and, uh, and uh, what the Court of Appeal might think about, uh, about your judgments. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, of those judgments, we'll come back to your practice in yeah. a moment uh, as a silk, but uh, whilst we're here, with those judgments... Uh, have any been particularly noteworthy in the insolvency sense, either personal or corporate? Yeah, um, of the ones that were appealed, there was one very interesting one, Paycheck, um, which was a decision on uh, legality of dividends, amongst other amongst other issues. Um, that was one where I reached a decision, the Court of Appeal disagreed with me, it then went to the Supreme Court, um, and uh, unfortunately the Supreme Court were 3-2 against me, uh, which I was a little aggrieved about, particularly as the the fifth judge uh, just simply gave a judgment agreeing with two of the other judges without coming up with a reasoned, uh, reasoned view. Okay, and had the two speeches that were on your side, were they broadly on your reasoning? That they were, yes, yes, absolutely, yes, yeah, yes, and, and they, they were the ones I, I would have preferred by, um, 
speech by Lord Walker and Lord Clark. Um, uh, who, uh, yeah. Hey, that's interesting, especially you know when you see that justice is served by well eight nine eyes, nine sets of well nine judges in total looking at that that, yes. that question. Then in that yeah. case, yeah, the, the, the actual point was on de facto directors and what what what, what, what made you a de facto director. Uh, ah. Um, Okay, well, 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 we'll pause for now on your judicial work and go back to your main work, which is, of course, your practice uh, at the bar. And we'll focus specifically on your insolvency practice, sometimes perhaps moving across a bit into company law. Um, what, what would you, in terms of reflections, looking back on your long career, would say were the highlights in terms of your insolvency caseload? Um, I think one of the highlights was acting in relation to the accident group, which was a, uh, a claims man- a very large claims management company that went into insolvency in about uh, went into administration and then liquidation in uh, around 2003, 2004, um, uh, and that gave rise to a, a number of quite interesting claims against the directors of that company directors disqualification proceedings and, uh, and various other interesting aspects and so that kept me busy for a long time and raised a number of interesting points. So did you act in the administration liquidation and the directors disqualification? Uh, I, I, I did I did indeed yes uh, yes indeed yeah absolutely. Yeah. And that, that would that have been one of your biggest cases post taking silk as well then? Uh, I think it probably was yes not not the not the biggest but um, you know certainly one, one of the biggest. And then when you were at the junior bar before you became yeah. a QC do, yes. what, what did you do personal and corporate work? on? on yes I, I, I did both um, as I mentioned before um, I did my uh, pupillage in, in Erskine Chambers which is a specialist company set so when I moved up from London for my second six month pupillage I did come up with some expertise, well, a limited amount of expertise I'd, I'd built up, or at least certainly specialist expertise in, in my first six months, and uh, the clerk was very keen to get me into doing corporate work, which included a fair amount of, of corporate insolvency work, uh, which I might not otherwise have done at that, at that sort of level of seniority. And then there was the sort of standard bankruptcy, personal insolvency uh, work around to do as well. So in, in that early, one of my questions was going to be, how did you first get into insolvency yes. but you've really just answered it yeah. haven't you with uh, your your pupillage at Erskine who, who were your pupil masters my I had a pupil mistress uh, Mary Arden as she then was uh, now, now Lady Justice uh, Arden do you ever appear before her in the course of appeal I, I have done yes yes <sighs> Yes. Yeah, that must be interesting. Where well, you see both your careers uh, you know, progressing. And, well, uh, well, it was, and, and my, my my second pupil master in Manchester um, also became a a judge and sat as one of the local specialist chancery judges. And I, I spent a lot of time appearing in front of him. Mm-hmm. Do you foresee in due course that you might um, apply? To become a full-time member well, it, of the judiciary, it, 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 it's an option. Obviously, one's got to be selected for it, but ah. uh, it's uh, it, 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 it's certainly an option to consider that yeah. in the future. But uh, I'm, I'm actually very happy at the moment with the balance between work as a barrister advocate, appearing as, a, as an advocate, and, and then having the uh, sort of, uh, the uh, privilege, as it were, of, of sitting as a, a deputy high court judge and, and judging cases from time to time. And do, you, do you find that judicial work improves your advocacy? Oh, very much so. I think you you know you, you can see what makes a good advocate, what persuades you as a judge is the right way to go about presenting your case. Mm. Uh, and whilst we're at this point, I should ask you that, um, what, what do you think makes a good advocate? I think it's somebody who has got a very structured argument and, uh, and, and, and thought through argument and uh, has a good strategy for seeing the case through to hopefully success. And is, is preparation and kind of uh, advanced planning and uh, yeah. how much of that goes into oh, your... absolutely. I think it's essential to be absolutely on top of the papers and uh, you know, know, know the facts, develop the law on the case and, uh, as I say, worked out where you're going with your case and, and what, what, you, what you need to win the case. David Graham QC once told me that he was acting in, a, in the Chancery Division on one occasion and he was asked to put the case for the other side. Do you, do you find that happens? Um, that, that, that can happen, actually, but a- actually that's something you should do yourself, I think, in, in, uh, in, in, in preparing your case. Because part, I think part of it is working out what are the other side going to say, and if you were on the other side, what would you say, so that as part of your preparation you can then deal with the arguments that are, that are put forward. But uh, no, it, it can happen that um, 
if the other side aren't represented, a, a judge will say to you, well, you know, what would the arguments be on the other side? And if you're making an application without notice to the court, at various occasions where you, you go before the court where you don't give notice to the other side, for example, injunctions and so on, where if you were to give notice that would cause, cause some huge problem if you give notice to the other side, it is your duty to the court to, to put the other side's case so that the, the, the court consider it in, in a fair way. Mm. No, thanks very much. Yeah, that, 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 that must shed an interesting light, I suppose, on when you're trying to argue against yourself and what you know, the fine points that you've been working on where they're weak. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. So going back to insolvency, we'll dwell a bit more on your practice later on because I want to ask you about what is basically a question about your absolute favourite area. But before we come back to that, and it might not be insolvency, you don't have to be biased yeah. just because <laughs> I'm asking this question for these insolvency shorts. But we'll go back to insolvency a bit. You've mentioned paycheck, uh, yes. the de facto case. Yeah. You mentioned the accident group and the various bits of litigation yes. from that. Are there, are there any other cases either which you've been involved in all that you've read that you're, you, you see as particular landmarks of insolvency or highlight cases? Um, well, I, I'm working on one at the moment which raises some interesting points, um, which is um, on the issue of the interrelationship between insolvency and, uh, and divorce and divorce proceedings and uh, uh, property adjustment orders that are, that, are, that are made on divorce, where we're seeking to challenge, as it were, a decision of the Court of Appeal in a case called Hill and Haynes. Uh, which essentially makes it very difficult for a trustee in bankruptcy to get behind a divorce settlement uh, where there is concern that uh, what has been achieved through the divorce settlement is something that has um, gone against the interest of creditors. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm interested in this area. You know, Gascoigne and Gascoigne very mm, early. Yes, um, yes, indeed. Yes, to, yes. To, to, to what extent do you think sometimes that these divorces are sham, they're fictitious. You don't have to talk to this point because yes. it's inappropriate. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Do, 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 you, do you think that there's sort of a gaming going on in, sometimes in these proceedings? I, I, I think there is, yes, yes indeed, yes. In, 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 that, that's certainly, I, I think, fairly common, although fairly difficult to prove. Mm. Um, yeah. I think it seemed to me on the facts that Gascoigne and Gascoigne it was like an artificial way, indeed. Actually, yes. Lloyd's Bank and Rossett, the, yes. the famous um, common intention constructive trust case or resulting yes. trust case with Lord Bridges' judgment, even the you know the name of the case, Lloyd's yes. Bank, yes. seeking to perhaps show that the Rossets in some yes. way had artificially yes. caused their estate to be something <laughs> yes. well yes. that was bad yes. for Lloyd's Bank. Um, yes. Yes. So um, uh, excellent. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll look out in the law reports for 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 that work. Um, it also raises an interesting cork cork report type point around other stakeholders mm. in insolvency. Mm. With a practitioner with a long history of experience, how do you view our current insolvency laws as a set of rules that take into account other stakeholders other than the debtor and creditors? I, I think it's very much geared up to, to debtor and creditor. And, um, um, I think there have been attempts to have better regard to the interests of employees and, uh, and others. Um, certainly in the formulation of director's duties in the Companies Act 2006, there is more of an attempt to look at other interests. Uh, but um, I think one, one could probably go further with that. Mm. Yeah, I think the uh, you know, sort of family interests and yes. those particularly you know, stakeholders that haven't had an active part to play in the position yes. in which the debtor finds themselves seem to be a very yes, yes. You know, sort of interesting area that, yeah. that, 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 that requires lots of yes. deep consideration. Again, have, have things have moved on a bit, things like the, the, the bankrupt's home in a, in, a, in a bankruptcy now, there are greater protections I think for the bankrupt and the bankrupt's family than mm. had previously been the case, it's rather more difficult for the trustee to actually realise the bankruptcy property yeah. and to have to make a decision fairly early on mm. whether or not to... Uh, uh, seek to recover the bank, uh, the matrimonial home. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so any other highlight cases apart from that 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 uh, Hill and Haynes potential appeal case yes, that, yes. that stick out? Any others? Yeah, I'm racking, racking my brains a bit at the moment, but there there, 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 there are there are quite a few. Yes, yeah. I think my um, my kind of highlights Canary Wharf, Olympia and York. Yes. As a sort of quasi testament to the rescue culture, with you know, when yes. you look over the London skyline and see yes. those buildings and think, well, you know, there's yeah. cork, there's rescue in action. Yes. Do, do you think yeah. there is a rescue culture on that point? 
I think there's much more. I, I started off in the in the days prior to administration, so it, it, where, where a company faced a winding up petition, for example, they either paid the debt or they or they were wound up, and it was it was simple as that. And the court had no discretion. So I've seen a huge sea change in in, in attitudes um, towards a, a rescue culture, and um, that's been consolidated well in, in the Insolvency Act 1986, and then consolidated by the. Uh, uh, by, by subsequent legislation, but so, so I have seen a huge change. And, but there are further things that, that could certainly be done. And do you think it's a, a real change in the sense of, well, you know, if one goes right yeah. back to the early seventies and Sir Kenneth Cork and things like Willie Stern and the Will Star Reconstruction, where you, or even Medforth and Blake in the early eighties, yeah. sort of trading receiverships that yes. definitely were the office holders trying to realise yeah. more value. Yes, um, that kind of what we might call pure rescue as opposed to some kind of, you know, I'm being very cynical here, but kind of like a marketing reselling of different mm. tools that in mm. fact benefit the office holder but perhaps don't benefit stakeholders in the sense of mm. creditor realisations. So what's your view of yes, rescue? I, I, I think, looking back to how we thought it was going to work when the 2000, to, uh, sorry, 1986 Act came in, um, rather envisaged that companies would actually survive rather more often uh, and that that would be a purpose of administration that would be achieved and administrators would go in, perform some magic and the company would come out of administration and, and things would continue. That That is a, a, a rare event. In fact, I can't think of a, a single case where that has the case I've actually dealt with where that's actually been achieved. But I think what has been achieved is it, it has been possible for administrators to achieve a sale of the business out of administration, possibly even to the former management or those connected with the former management, in a way that has saved jobs, for example, and saved the business in a way that wouldn't have occurred prior to the administration regime. So, yes, a, a rescue culture, but a rather different form of rescue, perhaps, than was, was initially envisaged by the... Uh, original legislation. And, and you've mentioned the 2002 reforms. If we mm. look at the way in which the purposes of administration were changed from section 8 to schedule mm. B1 paragraph 3 and the mm. hierarchical step through, yes. uh, some like well McCormack over yeah. at Leeds has argued that, that that new aim or set of aims is a transmutation is the term he uses of administration being a, a you know, multiple uh, yeah. stakeholder interested or duties owed yes. to all yes. creditors uh, and administrative receivership and yes. the selfish creditor interests that uh, yeah. were extant in that and that's why as a transmutation it's the two mm. procedures coming together that make the third purpose of administration much like administrative receivership do you, do you agree that that's a transmutation or do you think no it was a, a good reform that further heightened the rescue agenda I uh, I think there's there's a lot to be said for saying it is a, it is a transmutation and in some ways is is little different from the administrative receivership regime in that uh, in, in a lot of administrations it is the debenture holder who is making the appointment the uh, holder of the qualifying floating charge who is making the appointment and, and essentially controls events and controls the administration in much of the same way as as an old administrative receivership was was, was controlled by them in the past. Uh, I think is, is the practical reality of it, and so that perhaps hasn't been the sort of sea change in difference of approach between at least administ administrative receivership and administration that was envisaged by the 2002 Act, and that's certainly right. Uh, and other than administrative receivership and administration, both what we might call stage one administration, 1986 through to yes. 2002, and then stage two, 2002, yes. to the sort of pre-PAC era, yeah. other than those procedures. What's your general view of CVAs, company voluntary arrangements, and schemes of arrangement and their place in the restructuring toolkit? Yeah. Um, in reality, they've, they've, they've not proved very popular because, um, certainly as standalone CVAs, I think because they've lacked a form of, of control over them or a control mechanism that's given confidence to creditors that it's a process that they can have um, confidence in. Um, and um, I, I wonder whether um, the solution might be to, to, to move towards the, the American type of uh, a system of, uh, of, debtor, of a debtor in possession under the supervision of the court would, would provide some form of alternative, a more satisfactory alternative. Because I don't think the sort of standalone 
CV's, uh, CVL procedure, uh, sorry, uh, CVA procedure has, uh, has worked. So you think that supervision of the court, it's that element, the court supervision, as opposed to the so-called debtor in possession elements of Chapter 11 yeah. that, that appeal to you? Yes, um, yeah. Uh, well, well, in the sense that the, that the similarities are, there is the moratorium, and that's the, the key part of it, but a moratorium that's controlled under a process with which creditors can have confidence, I think that is, yeah. the, that is the key to it, I, I would say. What, do, what does that say, though, about IEPs as supervisors? Do, do, do they lack the confidence of creditors? Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying that sort of as an alternative ah, to, yeah. uh, to, to that and, and, and a position where it might be better for the, to, to leave the debtor in control of the company mm. rather than administration mm. or liquidation. And one of the huge problems with administration or liquidation is, is, is the costs involved and, the, and, frankly, the fees that are charged by insolvency practitioners and their, uh, their, their, their companies, which... Um, you know, we can understand why it's an expensive process, but it is an expensive process because you, you've got professionals doing things which need not necessarily be done by professionals. Mm. Yeah, something that based uh, uh, reflects on and cable tell, doesn't it, at length, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, yes, yeah. yes, indeed. That was the first major challenge to uh, uh, office holders' remuneration, yes, cable tell, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, thanks very much for that, that, that really uh, illuminating... Uh, discussion of the procedures that that was very interesting we'll move away a bit now from your experience of the laws either through your practice or just general engagement towards a bit of reform I know you've mentioned to me before Mm. uh, recent movements in uh, the way in which certain procedures are either court led or administrative led what what are your views on recent reforms yes I think so far as those reforms are concerned, I, I'm, I'm rather uncomfortable about them. I, I'll take as an example um, debtor bankruptcy positions. There's a bankruptcy positions presented by debtors. It, it's now essentially an administrative procedure, so you, the, the, the debtor fills in a few forms. Um, and there's a new office called the, the bankruptcy adjudicator, who is not a judge or have formal legal qualifications, who essentially processes these applications. Now, whilst there's the opportunity for creditors to review uh, any decisions taken on those um, determinations, um, it, it's not a process under the control of the court, and not a process under the control of somebody who has, as it were, the, the experience of a judge, and particularly an experienced bankruptcy judge, as to the, the sort of things that go on in bankruptcies and the sort of tricks that are played. And uh, one of the big areas here is, is, for example, bankruptcy tourism, where one's got... Um, people from overseas, particularly Germany, Ireland, companies which have more rigorous and uh, draconian uh, bankruptcy regimes, bringing themselves over to this country in order to make themselves bankrupt. Mm. And so you think that, that that reform is one perhaps that is ill-suited to the nature of how a debtor seeks relief really through the bankruptcy process? Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. mm. yes, yes. Yeah, I think, isn't, I can't remember the name of the case, but Richard Baster's recent adjudicator judgment with uh, that was bankruptcy tourism yes. case as well, wasn't it? Yes, well, it, it, it was. Uh, yes. I mean, a creditor can ask the court to to review the decision, yeah. and that that often happens where mm. your creditor who's been left stranded in Germany will come over and, and mm. say, "Well, look, the debtor should not have been made bankrupt in this country." Mm. But yeah. the, the onus is on the creditor to, to do that, and where, where perhaps it ought to be the court looking at it, examining it, and saying, "Well, no, you, you shouldn't be here in the first place." Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, well, we, we have to address it. It pains me to address this subject because um, of the outcome of the referma- referendum. But uh, what, how do you see Brexit impacting on the landscape of insolvency going forward, if at all? Um, well, I think I think it, it it creates significant problems and, and difficulties, which uh, it, it may or may not be possible to overcome. I, I think it's linked. I think the key issue here is is recognition of insolvency process. Um, There is a, as you're aware, an insolvency regulation, um, I think it first introduced in around 2000, there's a new second regulation, the 2015 European Community, uh, sorry, European Union regulation, which came into effect only last month. Uh, But this is a process whereby uh, one can achieve throughout the European Union, save for Denmark, which has opted out of it, Um, a a recognition of insolvency process where there's a requirement to issue main insolvency proceedings within the state in which the entity has a a centre of main interest as it's described. So that means that there can be a control throughout Europe on where insolvency proceedings are brought and then a recognition by other member states 
of those insolvency proceedings. Now, of course, if we if, if we leave the European Union and that treaty falls away, whilst we can, by our own legislation, provide that we will recognise um, the, the position in relation to insolvencies in other European countries, if they don't do the same, um, then one, one loses that um, reciprocity of, of recognition. Now, one hopes, as part of the negotiations for exit, um, that that is some that is something that can be negotiated as part of any any treaty between us and the uh, continuing countries in the in the European Union, and and it's linked in with more more general recognition of judgments as well under the Brussels Convention, um, which uh, again is a similar point that requires to be addressed. Mm, uh, absolutely, I think there uh, apparently there's a group of environmental lawyers who are getting together to cause a. Uh, uh, lobby group to make sure the protections afforded to the environment through European legislation yes. aren't lost to yes. England and Wales. Perhaps we uh, need to yes. mount a similar yes. effort. Well, it, 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 it has been done in the sense that the uh, the Bar Council, which is, as you know, is the, the governing body of the of, of barristers, uh, has uh, commissioned what they call the Brexit Papers, where they have analysed the various issues, which uh, such as insolvency and other environmental law and so on, and. Uh, are actually in close uh, communication with the uh, the Brexit department of the government in relation to these and liaising with them, and uh, uh, so it, it, it is certainly not being ignored. It's been, mm. been, been given some, some consideration. We'll, we'll we'll move away from that topic perhaps uh, for another time when we perhaps address it when you know when yeah. we see how things um, yes. uh, progress. Um, are there any other sort of uh, well what we might call Corkian ideas that you have? Fletcher Ian Fletcher's recently. Uh, mentioned in an insolvency intelligence article that he thinks it's about time for a cork part two. Mm. Do, do you agree? And if so, uh, any areas that you'd yes. like to examine? Uh, my own feeling is I don't, I don't think there is the need for the, the fundamental overhaul of the system that there, there certainly was prior to 1986. So uh, it, I think cork two would be a more modest exercise than, uh, uh, the, the, than cork one. But um, things like debtor in possession. Um, uh, thinking through ways in which rescue and recovery can be more effectively achieved w without the sort of burdensome processes of administration are, are, are certainly areas which you'll be looking at. Yes, definitely. I think, uh, uh, and this time perhaps we can have an academic on the committee. There wasn't one before. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, yes. I'm yes. not volunteering myself. Uh, yes. David Milman, he, he would yes. be a good, uh, yes. you know, I should clear that with him before yes. uh, <laughs> I volunteer him. Um, well, I'll, I'll bring our insolvency specific element of the interview to a, an end. Before I do, are there any other points you'd like to make on the insolvency no, side? No, I think, I think we've covered everything I... Uh, uh, okay, we, uh, we, yes. I, I promised earlier that I'd ask you about your absolute favourite area of practice. What What is that? <laughs> it doesn't yeah. have to be insolvency. It yeah. Be a... uh, well, I, I think I, I would say director's duties are, are probably um, my, my favourite area of practice, um, particularly in an insolvency context, mis misfeasance claims, um, what, what the scope of a director's duties are, the extent to which a director is liable to account as a fiduciary to, to the company. That, that probably is my, my sort of main area of interest. Okay, and then when you're not in chambers or on the bench, how do you relax? <laughs> well, I play a bit of golf. Uh, I like to escape up to Cumbria, uh, where we, uh, we we have somewhere to escape to and do some walking in the hills with, with, with my dog. Ah, yeah, and, that's a, uh, and you could mull... Just, just get, get away, yes. Yeah, yeah yes. exactly, mull on, mull on some of these issues. Mull on top of things, yes. Yeah, yes. While, while you're uh, yes. having a walk up a beautiful yes. part of the world. Yes. Um, Okay, final question, uh, or set of questions. What would your top tips be for any undergraduates or indeed early career pr practitioners who might watch this insolvency short for a, a, a top tip for a successful career at the bar such as the one that you've had? Yeah. I think the first thing is to um, try and identify the area that most interests you um, because the bar is a specialist prof profession. Um, and I think increasingly specialist, and we'll be looking out for people who have a real interest in, in particular areas of, of law. And the best way to achieve that is to get as much experience as you can through mini pupillages in chambers. I know they're not necessarily easy to obtain, but, but really do try and get mini pupillages in as many chambers as you can to just build up experience of what goes on in a set of chambers and the various types of work involved, so you can see whether or not you, you like it or not. So I think that, that, that is certainly part of it. And, and, and plan, plan ahead. I mean, think 
where am I most likely to get pupillage in the, the area that I, I want to uh, practice in. Um, but it's probably fair to say, um, you know, don't, don't be too over ambitious. You, you have got to be realistic. Look at the figures and statistics as to how many people actually get pupillage at the end of the day. Um, think very carefully about the expense of forking out for a, a, a bar finance course um, if realistically you, you don't think there's a, a realistic prospect of getting a pupillage at the end of the day. But you know, if you're the right person for it and you have the determination, um, you, you, will, you will get through and you'll get a pupillage and you'll, you'll build up a successful career at the bar. You mentioned earlier on that post graduation you were the sabbaticals officer at the Liverpool yes, the, Guild. One, one of them, yes, that's right. Yes. So, so yes. W w w w would that kind of extra experience yeah, be absolutely? And certainly from my own perspective, yes. Look, look looking back, um, I, I, I did that for a year straight after degree before going on and doing the bar finals course, and I was uh, what was then described as welfare and NUS officer. I don't know if there still is one at. Uh, Liverpool University, um, but in, in that role, in the welfare side of it, I was advising students on um, landlord and tenant issues, welfare issues, um, uh, which provided massive experience on, actually on landlord and tenant as, a, as an area of law, getting finding out about how, how the then rent acts worked and so on, which was good of experience, but also dealing with people and, and dealing with people's problems and how to handle people with problems. Uh, and I think it looked good on a, on a CV, I'd like to think it did, that uh, I'd, I'd gained that experience. And, um, you, and you're, you're, in a sense, you're still doing extra things now, aren't you? Because you're chairman of the Northern Chancery Bar Association. Uh, that's right, yes, indeed, yes. And yes. You, aren't you involved in your inn of court as well? Yes, I'm a, I'm a bencher of Lincoln's Inn, which means I sit on various committees in, in, in Lincoln's Inn and... Um, um, do, do dining and things like that, which is something that as a barrister you, you, you do. And within chambers, I'm, uh, I'm deputy head of my chambers and um, sit on the, the board of my chambers. So uh, post-graduation, but continuing that extra work through uh, yes. your career then? Yes, yeah. that, that's right. So, yes, yes, absolutely. Well, yes. Well, thanks, yes. thanks for that yes. top tip. So, um, yeah. well, thanks very much, Mark Corson QC, for that interview and your insight into the area of insolvency after your long um, career in the area. So oh, thanks very much. That's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah.